at the same time at the same time <laughs> all right mark are we on the internet nice well good morning everybody thank you all for being here and for coming back to our first in-person worship gathering in a while it's really good to see you all because normally i give these announcements to like three people in the back so it's really great to have you all here and to have everybody who is at home live streaming the service so Thank you all for being here. A couple of announcements before we get started is we're going to keep doing in-person worship services for as long as we can. The numbers seem to be trending down in this area, and as long as they keep doing that, we'll keep having services where everybody's masked and distanced and all that good stuff. Um, if that changes, we will let you know through Facebook and the website and all the other usual ways that we communicate with you. But you do have to register for services each week on our website. You can find that at grandviewchristian.org in the big yellow box on the front of the page which apparently, you know, the people in the room at least have found once before. So that's really good. If you're at home, it's really, it's really hard to miss. I made the, the color yellow as obnoxious as possible just for you. Um, a couple other things. We will have canopy groups continuing to meet for the foreseeable future. So canopy is just like a small group of people that you um, meet with either at your house or at the church, and you can just get together and hang out. You can get together and have a meal. You can do a Bible study or a prayer group, whatever you want to do. It's a way for us to try to gather and have meaningful conversations and relationships of some depth during a period of isolation and separation. So people are lonely. If you're one of them, uh, we want to help you find other people that you can be in relationship with. So you can find Canopy signups also in that big yellow box on the front page of the website. If you have kids, we don't have kids programming in person yet, but we're working on it. Uh, when it's safe to do so, we are hoping to have that back up and running. In the meantime, we do have online kids curriculum also in the big yellow box. At, you can go to the big yellow box for everything. It's called uh, Illustrated Compassion. It features videos of our children's ministers from both campuses doing dances and, uh, you know, lots of entertaining things and also studying the Bible. It's not just the dances, so check that out. Um, if you want to be outside... And doing something with your hands or just like moving around a little bit, we need people to help mow the yard, which is th not the yard here, obviously, but at the other campus. Uh, there's a lot of grass over there, and we've just had a lot of people who've had to move on to other responsibilities. If you're available to help with mowing, we would love your help. So just come and see me after the service or call the church office, and we can hook you up with that. Um, there is a a reading group starting at the Langston Center in town, the Langston Anti-Racist Reading Group. If you are interested in talking about race relations, especially as it relates to what's going on in the country right now, if you want to talk about a Christian perspective on that, if you want to hear other perspectives on that as well, uh, this is a community reading group that is available and open to all kinds of perspectives, and we want to have good and meaningful dialogue there. So if you're interested in that, you can find more information on our website or by calling the church office. Last thing, I promise, two for two has started for the fall semester. If you don't know what two for two is, back in the before times, we used to get together like 200 of us at once and have a meal and worship and classes, and it was really great. Now it's all online like everything else, but it is really cool and entertaining. We've done uh, videos that try to keep kids and adults engaged in uh, worship and lessons and other things like that. We stream that on our Facebook page and our website at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. It is a true live stream, so we are making fools of ourselves in, you know, in person at that moment. So you can catch it then, or you can come back and check it out later, and it's just as entertaining. All right. Thank you all so much for being here and for being part of this service. Let's just get started with worship. Well, I am so thankful that all of you are here. Uh, I'm excited to lead a, a room of people in, in singing to our God. Um, so as we open our connection with God this morning, let's just breathe, set our hearts on God, on the Lord. Um, and we want you to be free to worship, uh, to express your worship however you're, you're uh, comfortable in this place. So if you want to sit down, that's okay. If you want to stand up, that's okay. If you want to raise your arms, that's great. If you don't, that's okay. We all worship in different ways. Um, wherever you are is okay. Whatever you're bringing in your heart is okay. God meets us where we are, but we just want to open the conversation uh, with God this morning. So I'm just going to pray, 
and then uh, let's sing together. God, we are so thankful for this day that we can be together in this room. We know that we have been together in spirit over the last several weeks, but God, we are so thankful to be in the same room because there's something, uh, there's something really beautiful uh, about seeing each other's faces and eyes and joining in hearts in person to lift you up, to know that we are centered on your spirit. God, I ask that you will just meet each one of us where we need to be met this morning, but that you would receive our worship and truth from our hearts because we know that you're good. We might not always see it, but God, I ask that you would strengthen our faith in that, that you would reveal your goodness more and more, your work in this world. Help us to just lift our voices to you from the depths of our relationship with you, wherever we are with you, even if it is in doubt. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Because you are good good oh 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 let the king gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let.
Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. No point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. you have spoken of nature and science follow the sound of your voice Hello. and as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you stars were made to worship so will I 
If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. When you lost your life, so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art. You kindly chose surrender, so alive. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so Like you would again a hundred billion times. Oh, what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Maybe so. Faithful, steadfast, compassionate God, your care for your people is persistent and generous. Like the manna that fed the wandering Israelites, you rain down grace upon grace on us through your son, Jesus. Like the quail that strengthened them in the desert, you fortify us with your word. Like the water from the rock that slaked their thirst, you send your Holy Spirit to revive us. You take pleasure in our flourishing and give us good things. You call us treasured. You call us all to feast at your table. And your table is not set with complicated cutlery or place cards to manage seats. God, your table welcomes anyone who shows up. You feed us all richly, asking only that we love one another and love you. But we find that so difficult, don't we? We say we understand that we are all created in your image, but we fail to see you and those who don't look or speak or vote like we do. We hold up Jesus, who ate with sinners, fed smelly crowds, conversed with the snarky, touched the unclean, 
We claim that that Jesus is our model. And yet how quickly we abandon him. Rather than drawing others in as he did, we draw boundaries. We draw boundaries of fear, indifference, indignance, and self-righteousness. We don't want to be bothered. And we don't want to be deemed guilty by association. We miss the point that we are guilty, all of us. It is only by virtue of your invitation to new life that we are cleaned up, made whole, given hope, made guiltless. And for that, God, we thank you. It is through your son Jesus that we are taught how to graciously accept your invitation and extend it to others. God, may our gift to you, our table host, be humble gratitude and our best effort to be a worthy guest. Let us be instruments of healing for the sick, the lonely, and the hungry in our midst. Let our words be life-giving and our actions be motivated by genuine concern for the well-being of our family, our neighbors, and our communities. And God, let us always, always make room beside us for those who have not yet tasted your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What, what should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. The word of the Lord. Well, I have to say, I'm, I'm really happy to be back together with you guys, even to see half of half of your faces. Um, it's good to be together in a way that is really hard to explain uh, because we get so used to being online. I got used to standing just about there, and the camera was just about there, and there was a ring light, and the ring light represented all of your faces to me. Uh, but now I can see you, um, some of you, and the rest of you joining us online, and it is, it is a joy to be able to sing together, um, and I am grateful for you for being here, um, because I do think it is important to remember why we gather together, and uh, even obeying all of our safety guidelines, I appreciate that, because I think it's important that we take care for our community and, and still gather together in whatever way we can. I've been told that I uh, pre-grieve things. Um, <laughs> which is, I'm sure, a surprise to approximately no one. Uh, and this past week, the thing I've been pre-grieving is Thanksgiving uh, because I'm thinking about it, and I'm already kind of sad, and I'm specifically kind of pre-grieving Friendsgiving. Have you, any of you ever been to a Friendsgiving? I, um, this phenomena of Friendsgiving has kind of developed over the past decade and a uh, decade and a half. And I, I think it's this beautiful thing. I mean, friends are the family that we choose. And beyond that, I mean, the food options multiply exponentially at Friendsgivings. <laughs> because suddenly, everyone is bringing all of their families thing, you know? And then I started attending Friendsgivings when I moved away from West Virginia to Camden, New Jersey. And our f my, my family in West Virginia started to kind of farm out the Thanksgiving shindigs to individual family units. And my brother began going to my sister-in-law's family for Thanksgiving. So I just ended up staying in New Jersey and going to Friendsgivings there. And then when I moved down here, I just thought, well, I'll just continue the tradition. So last year, I got many wonderful invites to many wonderful dinners. But the first one I went to was Katie Mosby, if you know her, her epic Friendsgiving dinner. 
I mean, this requires chairs and tables borrowed from Grandview, and it goes out into the street in their cul-de-sac, and there were dishes on every available surface in the Mosby's very small kitchen, and Katie's turkey, which was brined to perfection, like days in advance. I mean, this is a serious thing. And guys, there were people. Do y'all remember people? Like, there were a lot of people, and there were good old-fashioned Grandview folks who at the time, to me, were new Grandview folks, and there were also a plenty of people who weren't from Grandview, who, in fact, were not from churches at all, who were just neighbors and parent friends and people that the Mosby's had steadily built friendships with and relationships with over time. And one of those friends had made a dish that was, for me, like hearing your native language in a foreign country. And that is the national dish of Puerto Rico. Now, I'm not Puerto Rican. Let me get that clear. This dish is called, I'm going to ruin it because I cannot roll my R's, so forgive me. It's arroz con dules, okay, which is basically the best rice you've ever had with these little beans called pigeon peas. Now, the Puerto Rican population in Camden is such that you can basically get this at any corner sto- store. It is always within a stone's throw from you, and now it is the furthest thing from a stone's throw from me. And I walked in to this kitchen and saw it sitting on the counter, and I promise you I almost cried. It was like a siren song to me. And I ran to Katie and I said, Katie, who made this? I have to like hug them, which was allowed at that time. And I need to cry. And I met Ashley, her friend, who was part Puerto Rican. And we got to chat and she promised me a recipe. And it was just like this glorious moment where everything came together. And it came together over food. There was this moment of connection, of friendship, of something mysterious and holy. I mean, food is a holy thing. It connects us to one another, to our bodies, to the God who made us and made the things that nourish us. There is a reason that so many stories in the Bible and so many of Jesus' miracles themselves revolve around food and the feeding of of people specifically, and why ultimately I think that Jesus himself decided to metaphor himself as the bread and the wine. And that connection is exactly the one the Corinthians are forgetting at the Lord's Supper. Paul writes them concerning their behavior and when they come together to celebrate this sacred meal. And I, and I do mean meal. See, back then, it wasn't just uh, pie crust and juice in a little plastic serving cup, okay? No, no, no. It was not COVID-friendly. It was a full meal, a dinner. They pulled out all the sops. They pooled their resources together for the purpose of both remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to fill their stomachs afterwards. It was a both and thing. It was necessarily that. And the Corinthians, they weren't exactly playing fair. I mean, they were letting some things separate them from one another. Now, there were different levels to this. I mean, some were uh, economic. I mean, some folks were just poorer than others and couldn't afford to bring as much to the table, literally. And so the Corinthians kind of felt like, well, they shouldn't give as much. They were still living in that before Christ mindset of you are worth what you can bring. And then there's this sort of social hierarchy thing going on. I mean, some people were just in a subclass to these other folks, and they they weren't getting to eat first or even second. They were getting the scraps from the table. I mean, and there's even room to speculate that there were some ethnic or racial tensions going into the mix. They're not just even Jews versus Gentiles, but beyond that. So when Paul says, I hear that there are some divisions among you, and to some extent I believe that, I kind of imagine this is like a dad tone, like him taking his glasses off and just like rubbing the bridge of his nose and just looking at them like dead-eyed. Like they were just letting these factions divide them. And here's where this passage takes a surprising turn, in my opinion. Paul says, and it's easy to miss this because he just slips it right in there. Paul says, factions are not bad. In fact, you need them. What? 
I mean, you might be thinking like me and Pastor Aaron over at Buffalo when we read this. You might be thinking, wait, am I missing something? In, in our increasingly factionalized world, thinking of factions as anything but divisional, bad, accusing, hateful, that's a hard thing to do. But no, Paul is clear here. Paul says factions are good and necessary because they will show you who is genuine among you. You catch that? Genuine. And I think that's really important language here. Not right, but genuine. Not on the correct side, not holier than thou, just genuine, proven sincere, proven to be what it is claiming to be. What are we claiming to be, siblings? Because if there's, there's a thing, if we're claiming to be followers of a gospel that is really for everyone, then we must end up at the table together. Even, even and especially with people you disagree with. Because if we are under the banner of no cause but Christ, the body and the blood of Christ makes us one. I mean, this is the closed circle practice. Remember those circles? This is the closed circle practice, the Lord's table. This is why we come to communion, to be reminded in spite of our factions, in spite of ourselves, in spite of our petty or not so petty differences that we are united by Christ hosting us all at his table. Reminding us that we are one by partaking in the mystery of this metaphor of his body and his blood in the bread and the cup and that we are all a part of God's body, the church. And it has to begin at the Lord's table. Because if we can let those factions, the factions in among us, the factions that Paul says are not a bad thing, if we can let those factions here in the church do the job of refining us, of showing us to be genuine enough to love truly, deeply, beyond those dividing lines that seek to separate us, enough to love and allow Christ to knit us together closer in spite of them we will be drawn into that mystery that christ is not just the host at the communion table here on sunday mornings in this makeshift sanctuary above a barbecue restaurant but christ is actually miraculously and spectacularly the host at all tables at all tables the dotted circle secret, remember this is your second space, this is where you go out and you are the host. The dotted circle secret is that anywhere we gather, whether we are believe with believers or with our non-church friends and family, when we are the host and we welcome them in, we are also welcoming them to a table where Christ is already present and inviting us to be fully present with them. Have you ever been in conversation with someone who's so present, it's almost, like, disturbing. Like, it's awkward to have their full, like, some of you are, like, looking away, like, don't look at me right now. Like, disturbing the amount of eye contact and focus because all of them is present with you in that moment. They aren't thinking about anything else. They aren't wondering what they're going to have for dinner. They're not already thinking about their reply to you. They're just honing in on you. It's, like, intimidating, right? Because we're not used to it. But what if we started to practice that? What if we were leaning into what we talked about last week, right? That unencumbered presence of God that is with us always, everywhere, in all circumstances. What would it be like to try to be that actively present to our guests? And when I say guests, I just mean people you're being with. Folks you've invited in. Folks you've spent time with. I don't just mean dinner party guests because those are illegal now. I mean guests of your presence. The person at your coffee table, 
in your car, on your porch, on the Tweety Trail walk you invited them to? What if you put your phone purposefully away and invited them to too and started talking truly and listening truly? Because folks, those factions, they're not going to fall away all by themselves. They dissolve into genuineness and are refined into genuineness by normal day-to-day conversations over weeks and weeks and months and months built into solid trust to the point where those scary subjects, the ones you've walled off and put over here, I can't touch that, that's the faction line, to the point where those scary subjects can be broached with trust and vulnerability and hopefulness and the knowledge that Christ is hosting you even in this. And then there's that pesky half circle. I wasn't going to forget about it. This is the one that's going to be painful every week, I'm afraid. And just know that I'm with you in it. We're all in it together. This one's always going to be awkward. And I'm going to be the first person to tell you that I struggle with this as well. Because in the first two circles, right, we all have a semblance of control. Right? We're still in positions of power in those two circles. We are the ones welcoming. The half circle is where that goes to die. (laughs) This is where we have to go out into the world. And we have to let the world host us. We got to be real comfortable getting uncomfortable. You're going to go where you're an outsider. Where you're the one for a change that's open to scrutiny and judgment. You're the vulnerable one. We're the humble ones. I've had moments like this, and I think if you think about it, you probably have too. Times when you've been invited by someone that you're just becoming friends with to go through something, you know, maybe by happenstance, and you end up somewhere where you quickly realize you're out of your depth. You have nothing in common with these people. You are the odd human out. Do you know this feeling? That's the feeling. If you don't know, Grandview is slowly taking over the thrift store game in Johnson City. Uh, I don't know if it was planned, but it's happening. Uh, It's a non-hostile takeover, but here it is. Uh, (laughs) Buffalo Campus's own Candace Yates now manages the Good Sam thrift store just downtown. Uh, and uh, not only that, but City View's own Shelly Morgan and uh, Mitchell Hancock, who you might see back here playing the drums, uh, are serving up looks and good vibes there as well. And I don't know if you know this. You might not. But our JC Serve coordinator, Nathan Kacharis, he works at a thrift store. And he works at the Family Promise thrift store. And between all of them, I think we should have, like, the corner on the market of secondhand goods in the Tri-City area by, like, next fall. I, I mean, I love it, because I'm pretty much wearing all thrifted items at all times. I, I just love it. And I meet with Bob Hall, who, who runs Family Promise weekly. And I go there so often that some of the staff know me. And I also get mistaken for staff quite a lot. They should be paying me. I, I, I'd like to, once it's kosher again and it's cool, I would like to hang out with some of the staff. I know next to nothing about them except that uh, we have similar styles and, and I go there to buy sweaters and men's flannels. That's all they know about me. And that I'm one of Bob Hall's pastors because he never passes up the chance to mention it. So I'm sure it'll be awkward. <laughs> Probably for like the first six to ten times we hang out because it'll be on their terms. Bully on their terms, doing what they're comfortable doing. Because that's how it should be. Family, this is a good place to be. Because this is how we get to be proven genuine. Proven to be who we are claiming to be, followers of Christ. This is how we get to practice table. Tabling with each other in a real way holy way that isn't pretense but practice this is how we learn what it means not to allow a world that screams factions are all that defines us to win but to let factions do what they are in fact 
meant to do prove that the gospel is and will always be meant for everyone, even and especially those you don't understand yet. And as we allow ourselves to be proven genuine, tried and true, we let the world be our host. Over time, this beautiful truth will be revealed to us. That Christ is still the host, even at those tables. Even at those tables where the world is sure that it's the host, Christ is still the host at all those tables, and the truth is that we are never alone. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for a gospel that is for everyone, even and especially people we don't agree with and don't understand. And the world tells us that those factions are all that matters and that we should just draw lines in the sand and never cross over them. I thank you, Jesus, that you're a God who crosses over those lines at every possible chance that you have come to table with us. At the Lord's table, you came and gave your body and your blood for us that we might be proven who we say we are, your followers, proven genuine. Help us to go forth from here to the tables where we're the host, to the tables where we're being hosted by the world, where we're uncomfortable, where we're awkward, where we're out of our element. God, help us to go to those places knowing you're still the host. Jesus, you still want us to be there. Christ, to see these people as made in your image, as worthy of the good news, as people who we should love truly and genuinely. And help us to table together, God, in a way that lets the factions do what they're supposed to do and prove us genuine. Help us to practice the table as we're getting ready to do now together. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. We come now to the part of our worship where we culminate and unite together at Jesus' table. Jesus set this table with place for anyone who call themselves followers of Jesus. It is not a table for those who are deserving, as we know Jesus was ridiculed for the inclusivity at his table, but it is a table where we all find life. On the same night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, leading to his crucifixion, he ate this meal with his followers. We follow the same teaching and example he left with them and that the global church has followed since. As Jesus did, we give thanks and break this bread as a representation and in participation with Jesus' body broken for us. We take and we drink of the cup as a representation and in participation with the blood that poured from Jesus' body shed for us. When we eat and drink this together, we are coming together as the no matter what family that God made us through Jesus. And together we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his return to us. In the back, there are four tables. Uh, We have double stacked cups, I believe, yes. Um, So while the music plays, if you would get up from your seat, kind of watch your distance, uh, take a cup, and come back to your seat uh, and take your communion there. Uh, And then on your way out, uh, after service, you can throw that away. Uh, Gluten-free is back here in this table directly where I'm pointing on the white glassware. Um, So just take your time, go when you're ready, uh, and then we will close together in singing uh, together.
sing with me whenever you're ready. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say to the grave. Thank you all so much for being here. It's been a long couple of months, long few months, and it just uh, it does all of us so much good to see your faces again. Um, thank you. Just one quick note before we close with the benediction. If you are in the habit of giving, we have our giving boxes at the back of the at the back of the room. That doesn't just support what you see here on Sunday mornings. That supports missionaries all over the world. It supports mission work in this city. Um, we are doing a lot as a church to try to serve our community, especially right now. 
So if you can, we ask that you would please support that and consider that a discipline and an act of worship as you, as you leave. We also have options for giving online. You can go on to grandviewchristian.org and set up recurring payments or a one-time payment. It's not too hard to do, but if you do run into trouble, you can call the church office, and we're more than happy to help you with that. Let's close with a benediction. As you go about your week carrying uncertainty and stress and a hundred other burdens with you, may you remember that Christ offers you a seat at his table, not because of what you have accomplished or who you know or any other thing about you, but simply because you are. May you live with a posture of confidence, knowing that the creator of the universe welcomes you and loves you. May you embody that love and welcome that you have been shown by God to others. And may the love of God go forth through you, bringing wholeness and healing to a world that truly needs it. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord.